Okay, hi, I, my name is Cassie Verber and I am a senior reporter with Quartz at Work. I'm very interested to hear more about this topic, the power of parental leave and returnship programs. Um, I myself have taken a couple of parental leaves and so I've got some skin in the game. Um, so before we go on to talk about this topic, let's, let, me, let me introduce my panelists. So first we have Maria Del Mar Martinez. She is Global Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer at McKinsey & Co. We have Debbie Caro. She's the CEO and founder at Inspired HR. Gina Buller, Executive Director of Insights at The Atlantic. Tammy Foreman, Executive Director at Path Forward. And April Chialika, Senior VP in Global Business Services at P&G. Um, can I just invite everyone to unmute and just say hello? Hi. Hello, hello everyone. Hi there. Good evening. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi, lovely to see you all. Um, so I'm in London, um, in the UK, and um, so on one time frame, and I think everybody is probably scattered um, around the world. Um, I'd love to hear where you are when we come to you. And what I'll do with questions is I will direct them to somebody, but if um, if anybody wants to jump in or has thoughts, please interrupt or um, just chime in with your, your thoughts and ideas. Um, so as we were just hearing, um, some research from McKinsey showed that one in three mothers has considered leaving the workforce or downshifting their career because of COVID-19. And I am immediately interested by this word downshifting. What do we mean by that? Um, are we talking about part-time here? And is that necessarily a downshift? I myself am part-time and I, I kind of balk a little bit at that description. Um, Paid parental leave programs and returnship programs are, are one part of that so the solution to this problem, perhaps. What action can companies take to relieve the pressure on working parents right now, and may maybe especially working mothers, because um, they are historically and actually at the moment the people that do most of the caregiving still. So, um, I also should say at this moment, I have a baby daughter upstairs because COVID is roaring through the nursery at the moment. <laughs> I hope um, she might wake up. Um, my husband will take care of her, but you know, uh, these things happen. So they especially happen now. Um, Debbie, maybe we can start um, with a question directed to you. Can you maybe help us to understand the challenges that mothers in the workplace are facing and how they've been exacerbated by the pandemic? I mean, so one of the things about the pandemic that we're seeing is it's disproportionately hard on women. That's probably not surprising to anyone on the call today is women are dropping out of the workforce at double the rate of men over the course of the last two years. And there's so many reasons for it. Uh, the primary one is childcare. So whether you've got extra responsibilities with homeschooling your children or you need to be available on a moment's notice if they have to go into isolation. Um, the other one is disproportionately women also take care of elderly parents as well. So the caregiving thing has been extremely challenging. And the other one we're really seeing crop up, and I think even as we get to an endemic state here, is the mental health crisis that we're seeing. And again, the data is showing us disproportionately women are experiencing mental health challenges significantly more than men. And so whether that's stress, whether that's depression, all of those kind of things we see are really skewing towards women and particularly women who have children at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't come as a huge surprise to me and probably not a huge surprise to other people on the call. I've, as a journalist, I've written about mental health, the mental health aspect of this and of course about the, the increased caregiving responsibilities with the caregiving that tends to fall onto women. Um, in the UK where I'm based, we have quite good parental leave enshrined in law. That doesn't exist anywhere by any stretch of the imagination, um, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. So there is also this other part, which is um, what companies can do. Can they um, help women to come back or can they um, help people to stay in touch while they're on leaves? Um, maybe Maria, could you talk a little bit about some of the, emer the emerging ideas to yeah. tackle this particular challenge? Yeah, and I think, look, the facts only, you know, reaffirm what Debbie has said, right? I think, you know, our research on women in the workplace that we do, you know, every year, um, we see, you know, working moms are 
uh, 1.5 times more likely to spend more than three hours working at home with uh, you know, kids compared to men. Um, and on, in COVID, it's even increased even more. Some people say remote working is working well for women. Mm, we see you know, almost 80% of men saying we're fine with remote working. That number is below 40% for women, right? So I think, so numbers are there uh, loud and clear, right? Um, what companies can do? Uh, I think we're seeing companies really, uh, I mean, the good news is that I think companies have increased the level of um, overall support to employees and uh, also especially for you know, diversity, equity and inclusion practices over COVID. Uh, and we've seen you know, also mental health programs being much more uh, you know, central to you know, HR strategies and, and what companies do. The, the, the problem as many times, right, is that even if the programs are there, the reality is the there's a bit of, and, and the priority is there, there's a bit of lack in execution, right? And mm -hmm. there's, this comes, and we've analyzed that, maybe it's lack of awareness of what are the programs to everybody. There's sometimes as well, um, the sentiment that even if you engage in a program, this might conflict incentives or rewards down the road and that problem still exists, right? And, and then there's a little bit of uh, role modeling that needs to happen. For example, we were discussing a bit on parental leave, parental rewarding, parental support. There's many times in many companies, lack of a taking leave culture, right? Yeah. So how do you face that? Even if you have the program, how do you make employees really confident to take that and that they don't feel this will penalize their you know, performance down the road? And have you got any answers to that question or has anybody else on the panel got any answers? How do you, um, how do you convince women, let's say parents, maybe? And, and men, eh? so, so to me, yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. parents, right? Think, it's yeah, very important I, to pass yeah. the message. Yeah, so I think I think you're absolutely right. How do we convince everyone of every gender who becomes a parent? And um, perhaps the, this is happening quite different ways for different genders at the moment, but doesn't necessarily have to. How do we convince them to take up these opportunities if they are there? And Maria, please answer that mm -hmm. if you'd like to, or somebody else jump in. I can jump in from a Procter & Gamble perspective. Do you see and hear me okay? Yes. So, um... So it is a it is a problem, and it does take uh, it does take role modeling as uh, that we were just talking about. And one of the things that we're really trying to do at PNG um, is celebrate those who are doing uh, these types of things. So a couple, just a couple of points. I'd, you know, our brands we've started to this share the care um, messaging for a lot of our brands, which is really sharing the care equally between partners, right? No matter what, uh, your house status is. And so it takes, uh, you know, it takes everybody in the family. And so we're really promoting that. And then internally we realized, Hey, if our brands, you know, we're trying to promote that, well, we need to be also leveraging that. And so a lot of our HR policies are now 100% equal, uh, maternal, paternal, adoption, all of that, we have um, the same benefits available to everyone. And that's making a, a big difference because we have to also say, hey, where our brands are, uh, you know, have this. So we need to role model it not only for ourselves, but for, you know, everybody who's watching our brands as well. Um, and so even uh, myself, uh, senior vice president, but I have leveraged the, when my, my son was small, I worked three days per week. It, at that time, it was really, really kind of scary to do that. But now I can talk about that very openly and share that as an example. And even within COVID, working part-time and then coming back full-time because I needed to do that last year. Um, so I think we have to, first of all, be brave and, and do it. We need to promote the our men counterparts who are doing it as well and tie it holistically, internally and externally. At least that's what PNG is trying to do, tie it internally and externally. Yeah. We need a challenge. Maybe one other thing is, 
you know, really challenge ourselves. So we have, um, you know, one of the things I'm really excited about that PNG is doing is the return to work program. We call it relaunch, but lots of uh, lots of companies are embracing that. Um, but it's like, why did we have this barrier to begin with where you didn't invite people back after, like if they did take five years off or whatever, because they wanted to focus on family. Why was that even a barrier? Why did we even not have, you know, this welcome home, welcome back kind of concept? And so that's been really interesting to, to just watch people embrace it just by acknowledging that we wanted to take that down. So yeah, I think you make a really interesting point, which is not, it's not just about the norms of what we do do, it's the norms of what we don't do. That's that we need to look at right mm -hmm. we we need to look at why so few men take long leaves instead of their partners maybe we need to look at why people don't come back why they feel that they are out of the workforce if they've been away for two years or five years or ten years um and why we don't value those the talent that's there despite the kind of gaps in the cv or gaps in the vertical commas maybe um what well, we're on the, the topic of these are the obstacles that are getting in the way of things like returnship programs. And um, maybe Tammy, could I invite you to talk a little bit about that? Like, what are we seeing? Why are people not taking them up? Why are companies not promoting them um, when they're not? And, or, and how are they doing them wrong if they are? Well, I think it comes down to intentionality, right? And incentives. So what Maria and April, April, I love share the care. I'm like, I, your PNG, the the Olympic mom commercials always used to make me cry. So like, like expanding that right to share the care and think about equality is like I'm I'm getting goosebumps. But I think it comes down to incentives, right? Like, like saying you have a program and saying don't worry, you won't get in trouble is fine and all well and good but if the only people who end up in the corner office are the men who never took leave and have stay-at-home wives the message gets sent so you can talk all day but like if that's the message that's the message and so i love the role modeling that april is personally doing because that is what makes a difference when you have someone who's a senior vp who spent a period of time working from working three days a week like that that's how you show and and make it okay and you have to expand that and it's the same thing with returnship programs right like saying hey we're gonna bring people back no one i gotta tell you i've been doing this for six years now no one ever says no to me right mm -hmm. this is a great idea it's literally apple pie and mom no one says oh that's a terrible idea they love the idea it's the execution right it's like well but then you start to talk to the managers and like how long have they been out and what did they do before and do they really want to come out? right like and so you have to incentivize it like if managers get in trouble when they hire someone and it doesn't work out you are sending a very strong signal that we don't want you to take risks mm -hmm. and the companies that do a great job is when senior managers ceos and people in that senior management position say you're not going to get in trouble we're doing this and you're not going to get in trouble because it's going to work these women are amazing <laughs> they're going to be fantastic but like you got to get the managers who are making these decisions on the ground it's real easy for executives to say things super easy for executives to say things but you have to think about what the downstream incentives are of what you're asking people to do and are you lining all those incentives up and then what maria was saying about the role modeling is super super important the reason i think returnship programs work so well when they work why they get established within companies is because once people start hiring the role model is there right that's that's the the beauty of it um and is there something about sort of insisting on visibility as well that um perhaps if people are returning to the workforce, maybe they've been out for a year, they want in some ways, or they've been taught to want to slip seamlessly in to a job, doing it as if they'd never been anywhere, not asking too many questions, not disappearing too much to do childcare, mm -hmm. maybe not talking about the fact that they are not wanting full time, for example. Well well, with any of these things, visibility can be a double edged sword. And, you know, I, and I'm always, but let me just sort of put some facts on the table, right? What, it, COVID notwithstanding, like what we've seen in our program over the last six years is not people coming back after a year or two. I mean, there is definitely some of that, that absolutely happens. 
our community, the average amount of time out of the workforce is six and a half years. And that is because we live in a society that does not fund childcare until first grade. There's no magic to that number. That didn't just come out of like, oh, that's how long people want to spend at home, right? That's a very specific public policy that we have in place. But I just want to set that frame because that's like, it's a very different, when you're talking about five, 10, 15 years out of the workforce, it's different than like, oh, I, I, had, I took a long maternity leave, which I think sometimes yeah. get munched. But but if I can comment even, and, and this is even a personal passion of mine, uh, also because of you know what I suffered <laughs> when I was through the process and I have three, three boys. Uh, uh, now it's not that they want to be with mom, they want to do other things, right? But um, uh, no, but I think also the, uh, how do you report uh, parents after long leaves? Uh, long, not not the you know five year or six year, but even a one year or a six months, eight months long leave, and that they don't lower their ambition levels, and that uh, I think to me that is um, crucial for keeping a healthy pipeline towards leadership positions to the point that you were raising, Tammy, and I think uh, it is very important um, to. So let me share what what we uh, and we we did that in one region specifically in 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 McKinsey and now we're extending globally. But you know a rewarding program that brings evaluations are a bit covered in the beginning, that brings the key office manager signing a plan for development of that person, woman or man that comes back after a long leave. Some incentives to your point, and it's not a big, big, you know, but it's an incentive to the team that would take this person for the first, you know, projects or things. So there's a bit of an incentive for rewarding the person, right? So that the person has not to be, you know, knocking at the door of everybody. What can I do? How I can help? And, you know, and, and, um, and of course, some coaching and some additional support, but just having that has made we have reduced attrition in that specific group by 20%. Mm -hmm. And that is the group that makes it or break it in the end towards leadership positions at McKinsey and outside McKinsey as well, right? So I think to me also being extra careful at that moment of coming back from maternity, giving the confidence for people to still, you know, be on path to leadership positions is very relevant. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have agree more with that. I came back from maternity leave just in March 2021. And I would say even just taking 20 weeks, it can be a little bit jarring to come back. So having a plan for your reports when they come back, I think is so important. And Gina, would you say what what surprised you about your experience? And what surprises you when you when reporting or when looking at this, um, the kind of area of caregiving and how it relates to women in the workplace. What kind of surprises you now? What surprises me the most is just the perception that childcare still is so considered women's work. I had a generous maternity leave with the Atlantic that I appreciate, but my husband's company, he was not deemed the primary parent. He was not defined as this company by the primary parent. Doing only had two weeks. And I took such offense to that term because there is no primary parent. We're both primary parents. Uh, and, you know, people say all the time to me, it's so great your husband helps you. And he is great and he does a lot, but he's not helping me. It's a kind of a co captain sort of situation. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't agree more. I'm actually reading a very interesting book at the moment, which I will quickly recommend to everyone called Noise, uh, which is about the, the noise that surrounds motherhood. And that is the stuff that we are told um, constantly by society, the stuff that we tell ourselves about ourselves and the stuff that we tell each other about mothering, the, the way we reinforce this to each other. Um, and I'm only halfway through it, so I won't tell you any conclusions, but I'm finding it very, very inspiring and insightful and kind of making me rethink what I do, uh, even as somebody who thinks of themselves as progressive and, you know, role modeling and all that, that stuff. Um, Adding that to Amazon cart now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we've talked about some potential solutions. We've talked about some of the obstacles. Um, 
we're still in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, I don't think when we all started working from home two years ago, we thought we would be here. Um, I only had one child at that point. Gina, you didn't have any. Um, people are going through this, leaving the workforce, coming back into the workforce, still all contained within this experience of the pandemic, which in some ways is leveling things out. Um, you know, if you're a man working from home and your child is there, they're there <laughs> as much as they're there for me and upstairs. Um, but, and in some ways doing the opposite, kind of driving women further away from their, their, their work goals maybe. So what's next for, where do we get, where do we need to go next? Can the pandemic be an opportunity to get some of these programs working better? Um, for companies to change more and faster, and are they? Um, I don't know who would like to jump in on that. Maybe maybe Debbie could talk about that a little bit. Sure, I'll start there. There's so many different things. Um, some of the really interesting ones that I'm seeing uh, globally, first of all, as we move out of the pandemic, I think this move to a four-day work week is very, very interesting and very, very helpful for women. Uh, in the UK, we've seen the data that 12% of childcare jobs have disappeared, which is going to make childcare even more challenging. But if you're lucky enough to be in a home that's got two working parents and they can both work three days a week, you've just taken care of a significant portion of your childcare. So I think this move to a four day work week that we're seeing and testing and not a compressed work week where we don't try to make people work 40 hours in four days, but I really think that a move to less hours, less days a week is a critical one. The other one I want to talk about that I think is really important is this hybrid work model and the flexibility around work. This is really important for employers to embrace, but the piece that's most important that we're going to see as it relates to women in the workforce is whatever decisions and policies organizations put into place, they have to put it in place unilaterally. So what I mean by that is if we all of a sudden say everyone's got the choice if they work remotely or they work in the office, what we see is predominantly men are choosing to go back into the office and predominantly women and people in lower income jobs are choosing to stay home. And so whether it's costs, whether it's childcare, that actually causes a real problem as you look to the pipeline in the future, because I think we all know that when you're in front of your boss and when you're collaborating with your peers, if you're in the same room, it really is different than when you're from home. So if you've got a segment of the population that's there in person schmoozing sort of water cooler talk golfing whatever that looks like in the future and you've got a portion of the workforce that's working from home that can be really dangerous so i think getting these policies right is one of the most important things we can do as we move to hybrid workforces would you like to see debbie would you like to see companies mandating part weeks from home part weeks in the office something like that so that so that everybody without childcare responsibilities can't immediately rush back five days a week. 100%. I, I would love to see a blend. In mo I mean, it's not realistic in every workforce. If you're frontline, if you're customer service, there's some that people are going to have to be in person. But if we want to retain talent and we want to attract talent as organizations, we have to be flexible. And people that are going to look prospective employer employees are going to have to be able to imagine that the positions are going to work for their life. And there's this huge mismatch of skills and what we need. And so any organizations that are not sort of becoming more flexible around these issues are going to run into real problems when it comes to talent moving forward. And so I think this is really important for all of us to take a long, hard look on mm -hmm. what the future is going to hold. And I do think that part of the secret is that four day work week. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take a quick poll, just show of hands, who's in the US? And Europe? And Debbie, where are you? I'm in Canada, Vancouver. Okay. Um, do you think that there is any chance in the US, those US-based people, um, or anybody who wants to comment on it, that we'll see more support from, more governmental support for child rearing? in the next years, what would that look like? I mean, it's hard to hope right now a little bit, isn't it? And actually that was gonna be the point I was gonna make is like, I think the biggest thing that we need to think about with the pandemic is that the pandemic didn't cause all these problems. They're longstanding. And if we don't 
actually like I think one of the problems of the pandemic has been this like oh it's going to be over any minute now so we don't really have to worry about whatever right because it's going to be over any minute we don't need a plan for remote school because it's going to be over any minute we don't need a plan for testing it's going to be over any minute right like that's kind of been this perpetual theme at least here in the U.S. and I think elsewhere too by the way but I think that if that carries forward right like women's workforce participation rates in the U.S. leveled off in the 90s right like this is not a new problem. It's worse, like dramatically worse, but not new. So I think we got to start looking at, you know, policies and practices that are going to make a difference, that, that are going to start, that are going to solve those problems that were long standing. And I think some of the things Debbie's talking about are, are right. I think I think companies have to look at the policies with an equity lens. If they just try to like do it the way they typically do things, we are going to wake up and I, look, I think it's going to be, I think flexibility is going to be good for individual women, no matter what, a hundred percent. Like I think in terms of financial security, staying attached to the labor force, right? Long-term income security is all going to be good for individual women. I do think if we're not careful about it, we're going to wake up in 20 years and realize that we have not budged on leadership. And that's where you're going to see those, the, the inequity of the policies show up. Um, and that will not be good news. There is a chat um, function on this call. And if anybody would love to th like throw a question in there from the audience, we have a couple more minutes and I'd be happy to put those to the panelists for you. Um, I wonder if um, anybody would like to kind of weigh on, on, on the idea of what the one thing that a company could do now, because we, we what we're coming down to is that it's down to companies to do this. It's not really for individuals to push anymore. Like we've pushed a lot. Maybe it's not gonna happen from government. Like what is one thing that a company could do today, tomorrow, in the next weeks to make a real difference? Standing up for your employees. Um, I think companies, it is their responsibility and they are so much a part of it, but the internal company policies should remain when you're dealing with clients, when you're dealing with vendors, you know, it's one thing to put a policy in place that you don't work on Fridays, but if you're a client driven company, that's where that usually falls apart. So, you know, sticking to those resolutions and working with whoever's outside of the company is really important too. Yes, yeah, so sort of managing expectations of, of what your clients or customers, what they're asking of you as well, so mm -hmm. it doesn't kind of fall back onto um, your workforce. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. For me, and to, go ahead. <laughs> go, go, Debbie. Just really quickly, one we haven't touched on today that I think is important, and ironically, I think McKinsey does a good job of this, is keeping people that are not currently in the workforce, so whether they're on a short parental leave, whether they're on a five-year gap, keeping them connected to the organization is A, gonna make them more likely to come back, and B, it's gonna have that learning curve, the on-ramp, have less of a steep curve if they're attached to the organization. So whether you have an alumni chat on Slack, whether you keep them invited to certain company events, keeping them connected to your organization is going to help so many of these issues. Yeah, I think you make a brilliant point and um, it, it's one we're going to have to end on, but I think making helping people to stay connected in ways that is possible while doing childcare, if that's what they're doing, I think would also be really, really useful. Without making them work. It's the social piece. <laughs> Okay, I think we've run out of time, but um, thank you so much to everybody who's joined us um, for a fantastic panel and um, thank you for all of your insight. I wish we could have talked for longer. Thank <laughs> you.